Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. I hope you are enjoying your day. So welcome to the series, Mud Talks. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director of the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations, and I will be your moderator today. We thank you for attending today's event, and we hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this time. As you know, due to COVID-19, our basic way of life has been turned on its head, and many of us are feeling stressed and overwhelmed of the uncertainties around this pandemic. Today, we have Susie Gruber, class of 87, who will describe the basics of how our nervous system responds to threat, what's unique about this pandemic experience, and why and how to attend to our emotional needs. Susie holds advanced degrees in chemistry and psychology. She spent 15 years in biotechnology before returning to her first love of inspiring people to transform their lives. This talk is being recorded, and we will distribute the link and any presentation material after. So don't worry if you do miss a part of it. Uh, Susie will start with a brief presentation and we will take questions from the audience as we go. So please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. Without further ado, I turn this over to our speaker, Susie Gruber. Hi everyone, it's so good to see you. It's such an honor um, to be here with you and, and be supporting our beloved Harvey Mudd community. I want to reiterate what Vanessa said about um, asking questions, giving feedback, um, just, you know, sharing what's happening for you. My intention with this uh, talk and conversation is for it to be somewhat experiential. And I'm going to ask you at various points throughout the way to just, you know, see what you're noticing. And, you know, I probably prepared way too much information because I'm so excited about this topic. So we'll just see where we go and and I'm going to make the slide deck available to everyone as well. So I'm just going to share my screen here and hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I just want to start with uh, a little overview. So as Vanessa said, I'm going to start with a, a basic introduction to what our human threat response even is. Um, then I'll talk about how this pandemic is different from other sources of threat that we encounter in our daily lives. And then I'm going to talk a lot about self-care and different elements of that. You know, being that, that I'm a scientist by training, I, the first place I want to begin here is what is stress? What working definition are we going to hold here as we're moving through this, this conversation together? And it turns out that's actually not a simple question. There's a lot of controversy about it, but for, for our purposes, I think about it as a condition or feeling experience when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. So the key pieces here are, it's what we perceive. So what I find stressful might be a walk in the park for you. And that's super important because um, it helps us have compassion for each other as we move through this. Another key piece here is to emphasize resources. So we might have, you know, it's, it's this, the image I like to use is, is, you know, filling up our cup. We might be okay until we get that one last text or that one last phone call and it just kind of takes us over the edge. So there's two types of threat that I'm going to talk about initially here, kind of the two buckets that I think of. And, and I just want to say that these two types of threat are closely tied to the two types of trauma that we generally see. The first one is um, physical threat. And with physical threat, what I mean is, you know, are you being chased by a bear, right? Is there some literal physical threat to your life in this moment? And that creates a very much brainstem mediated response, very physiological, controlled by our lizard brain, not a whole lot of cognition going on in terms of response. And there's kind of five phases to this physical threat response. And these happen without us even knowing it. So the first is to orient to the, the threat. So when we first hear those footsteps behind us or, or hear that pounding on the front door, or we see that, that lion off in the distance, like we orient and then very quickly our brain goes, okay, is it a threat? If, if we're talking about a human threat, there might be an attempt to engage in order to mediate the threat. Now, you know, that's how we talk ourselves out of traffic tickets, right? Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have to immediately resort to fight flight. You know, if I'm being chased by an animal, I'm not going to sit around and try to make friends with it. I'm going to get the heck out of there. Now, one of the things that we see in the animal world all the time is that 
you'll see an animal, like if it's being chased by a predator, you'll see it just flop over in this free state. And it turns out humans do the same thing too. It just doesn't look quite the same. And then if it's truly hopeless, they go into fold, which is it's over, it's hopeless, and it's kind of just this place of, of I can't do anything about this. So when there's an event that's threatening, there's stages to our threat response. When we're in it, the first place is just survive. Like everything in our body is focused on helping our organism to survive the event. Just after it's over, there's this sense of shock that can be very physical. We can be very fuzzy. We can have trouble making decisions. After a few months have gone by, we might notice that there's still kind of a hypervigilance lingering, that, that survival energy that's still left over. And we might start to see sudden emotions rise. We might cry at the drop of a hat. We might snap at friends and family. And then in the long term, there's, a, there's symptoms that emerge. We might have flashbacks. We might have physical symptoms. And, and that's kind of the sets the stage where if we don't address them, um, we can really have long-term difficulties. And that's what has been identified in, in the world of, of psychology as PTSD. And, and this is specific to shock trauma, which is trauma as a result of some kind of event that's physically threatening. So it could be a car accident, it could be a natural disaster, it could be war, it could be a surgery gone bad. But the key elements aren't about relationship, it's about some kind of physical threat. So I want to just show you here, um, there's a wonderful trauma researcher named Bessel van der Kolk who did um, MRIs of two different trauma survivors' brains. So on the left side here, you see a brain that's in fight response, right? All that gray stuff there is, is the neocortex. So when the brain's in fight, the neocortex is still somewhat active. The person on the, the right actually was this other person's wife. So it was man and wife that had been in a car accident and they had very different leftover responses to this event where the wife was totally in freeze and literally could not think. So I'm showing you these just because there's a lot of data out there now about how threat and trauma literally changes our very capacity to think. So if in the face of COVID you find yourself frozen and you don't know what to do, chances are that there's a lot of, of kind of activation and arousal going on in your system. And, and I'm showing you this to show you that that's perfectly normal. So the other kind of threat that is actually um, really common in our culture is relational threats. So when we grow up in, in environments, households where there's abuse of some kind or neglect or misattunement, meaning people aren't paying attention to our needs and desires, children develop survival strategies in order to minimize the abuse and, the, and the prevent um, as much rejection as possible from happening. Now, these survival strategies can look like suppressing needs, pleasing others, taking care of other people at our own expense, suppressing emotions, isolating, and literally denying reality. And this is just a few of them. I mean, there's, there's so many ways that, can, that this can look. Um, and I want to say that, that this, this um, fear of rejection that's kind of running in the background for so many of us, it literally can feel like a mortal threat because the origin of this is that for children, being rejected, like fully rejected by their family would be a mortal threat. Like a two-year-old, like if you leave a two-year-old alone, the two-year-old's not going to survive very long. And there's all kinds of studies out there about failure to thrive. So I want to invite you to just take this in for a moment because here's a slide where I've kind of put up a bunch of these different survival strategies. And I want to invite you to consider for a moment which ones of these are familiar to you. Like, do you tend to isolate? Maybe you tend to please other people. Maybe you tend to work harder. Or maybe because, you know, so many of us are technically trained, our impulse is to try to understand what's going on and we dive dive into the research on corona and, and all the policies on corona. We just want to know, want to know, want to know, and then we exhaust ourselves. Or maybe we want to control everything. So, so because there's this coronavirus, right, that we can't control, we, try to, we start to try to control as much as possible in our immediate environment. Now, needless to say, that can drive our friends and family members crazy. And I also want to name that maybe you see one of these in the people that um, are close to you. 
So again, this is totally normal that we adopt these kinds of strategies. And the more we can be aware of them and what's going on inside us, the more we can go, oh, I know what this is. You know, maybe I, maybe I don't need to actually go hide right now. Maybe maybe what, I, what would actually be better for me is to have some connection and social engagement with people. So just take a moment and see if any of this resonates. Um, it can be a little intense to see this stuff in yourself. So I just want to really acknowledge that too. Um, I also, as you're thinking about that, want to name that, that this theme of relational threat actually in, in our field now has a name. There's now the, the diagnosis of complex PTSD that comes from chronic um, mistreatment in childhood. And that a lot of these survival strategies when they're extreme can really um, develop into difficulty around um, sustaining, you know, progress towards goals, difficulty with relationships, all that kind of stuff. And then another piece here um, that I, I want to really name is that when something like Corona happens, right, when a big stressor happens, it tends to amp up these strategies. So if you notice yourself for example, more than ever wanting to be helpful or noticing that you want to be perfect or that you're working even harder. Again, it's possible that this is your um, way of trying to manage the stress that's going on. All right. So since I just um, stirred up some stuff here, I want to do a little self-care exercise. And before we get into it, I want to just kind of talk about this little diagram that I have here. It turns out there's a nerve that runs from the base of our brain all the way down into our intestinal tract. And it's called the vagus nerve. And it enervates all of our major organ systems, lung, heart, stomach, liver, intestines, like the whole thing. So it's a pretty important nerve. And one of the really interesting components of this nerve is that actually um, the communication between our brain and this nerve, most of it goes from our body to our brain and not the other way around. So it's sending signals to our brain. Now this, that turns out that this makes it a really interesting um, opportunity to interfere with our stress response and to settle it because um, when we can interact with our vagus nerve and kind of send the, the message, oh, I'm actually okay right now, that goes into our lizard brain and we actually settle. So I wanna invite you right now, if it feels okay to you and if it doesn't, that's fine, but just take a hand, it doesn't matter which one, and put it on the base of your skull, just right, up, right at those two knobby points that are called the occiput and just put your hand there. So funny, as soon as I do this, I just notice myself settle. But put your hand there, see what the, what kind of pressure is right, you know, put your hand in just the right place. It's, there's no exact position here. And if it feels okay to you, close your eyes. If not, keep them open, whatever is good for you. And just take a moment and notice what happens here. Like I know I notice as I'm doing this, I notice my breath deepen, I notice my shoulders drop a little bit. And when we put our hands here, it's it's literally the closest we can get to touching our own lizard brain. Like it's, it's like literally providing like this holding for our lizard brain and sending the message, okay, you're okay right now. You know, if I'm doing this to myself, then it means I'm not actually fleeing a tiger. And then another thing you can do here is like you can take your other hand if you want and just put it on your belly. Like there's different places you can connect with the vagus nerve. And I've just discovered for myself anyway that it feels really good to have a hand on, on the back of my neck at the same time as I put a hand on my belly. And there's something about just kind of holding both ends of the, 
the vagus nerve for me that, that feels really settling. And then when you're ready, just letting that go. And Vanessa, I just want to check in and see if there's any questions at this point, because I've already said a lot. <laughs> I just want to honor that. As of right now, I don't have any questions, but if anyone does, please put in the Q&A box. Thank you. Great. So next I want to talk about what makes this um, experience we're all in different from pretty much anything else you know, humanity is faced, honestly. Um, so COVID-19 came on very suddenly uh, it, and it created an unprecedented long-term change. So our basic way of life is, is fundamentally altered right now. And we really don't know at this point what it's gonna look like going forward. Will we be able to gather, you know, in big stadiums to see sporting events? Will we be able to go to concerts? What is school gonna look like you know, are we going to be able to have um, big parties? Like, like just unprecedented, sudden long-term change. And this is universal. This is worldwide. It's not just like a natural disaster like a hurricane in Florida. This is literally affecting everyone on the planet at the same time to a greater or lesser degree. And one of the things that makes this experience so challenging is it's an uncertain duration. We don't really know how long, to, long the effects are gonna last because we're still learning about the virus itself and the, how contagious it is and what's gonna be necessary in order to um, keep people from getting this thing. So that uncertainty um, can create a lot of, of fear and helplessness. And I really wanna speak to that because um, you know, unlike a natural disaster that has a beginning, middle, and end, when we don't know what's going to happen, it can tickle old feelings of uncertainty that we have from our history and old feelings of helplessness. So if we have stuff in our history, particularly as children, where we, we truly were helpless, where, you know, we grew up in a challenging environment that we couldn't change because we're children, we were children, that can literally kick up an association where we feel more helpless now than we actually really are. So on lo one level, of course, I can't walk outside my front door and wave a magic wand and, and disappear this thing from the earth as much as I would like to. Um, so in that, from that standpoint, we are truly helpless to, to make this thing vanish. But by, by asking the question, okay, what is this helplessness really about and bringing curiosity to, to what we're feeling, we can distinguish between, okay, I'm really helpless about this. I, 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 there's only so much I do, can do, for example, for my elderly family member who's um, in an assisted living facility and I can't go visit right now versus, okay, wait a minute, I can actually, you know, drop off um, food treats or, um, you know, find other resources for them to still have connection. Like, so when we, when we, make friends with our helplessness, it helps us feel more empowered because we can distinguish between where we're helpless and where we're truly not. Um, this um, experience activates both the physical threat and the relational threat response. So the physical threat is obvious, right? The virus can be deadly and we're still learning um, what the risk factors are. There's some talk that it's genetic. There's lots of conversation about how people with underlying health conditions are more susceptible to it. Um, but it also activates our relational threat response because many of us um, are both more disconnected from the people that matter most to us, or in other cases, all of a sudden we've got kids at home or elders at home um, that weren't living with us before. So all of a sudden, all that relational stuff is kicked up. And Again, that's where our survival strategies and our old history can really become intensified. Let's see. Yeah, so I, I just really wanna encourage all of us to really honor that whatever you're experiencing, um, 
to be curious about it. Curiosity is really such a huge antidote to what's happening right now because when we're curious, right, curiosity is a different um, cognitive experience than being in a sense of threat. Curiosity means that, okay, I'm tracking my experience. I'm not totally consumed by my threat response and I can make choices about what's going on and, and how I respond. So when it's too much, I just wanna name some of the characteristics here. We feel anxious, reactive, helplessness, helpless, I mentioned that. We can feel trapped and stuck. We can feel panicky. Um, we might feel hopeless and shut down. These are all very normal um, responses when something's happening that has exceeded our, our resources and that, and that we, hang on. I apologize. I'm going to wait. Okay. Sorry about that. Somebody's about to knock on my front door and I'm going to ignore them for now. Um, you know, all of these responses are completely normal and, and each of us is going to have a different uh, kind of default. Um, and again, I want to really name that our old history will skew this. And I want to speak a little bit about anxiety. It's really important when something like this isn't happening to differentiate between fear and anxiety because they're not the same thing. Fear is an emotion that is related to threat. And often anxiety is actually a process that happens as a result of fear. And often underneath anxiety, if we look closely, what we find is actually unresolved anger. And I know that might sound really weird, but um, this is why uh, it's so important for us to actually take time and be with our emotions rather than just pushing them aside. And I'm going to say more about that in, in a little bit. Now, this feeling of trapped and stuck, this is super important because, again, part of how our old history gets activated is as children, we were trapped and stuck. I couldn't just go down the street and say, you know, I'm done with my parents. I'm going to go live with the neighbors. Like we can't, a two-year-old can't do that. So, so when there's a history of feeling trapped and stuck in, in an environment we can't control, that can be a default that then um, gets activated when something like this is, is happening. So it's really important to consider, okay, what's actually happening right now? Where is the actual threat for me? Okay, COVID's a real threat, but wait a minute, nobody in my immediate environment has it. We're taking appropriate precautions. We're wearing masks, or maybe we live in an environment where there's just not that much of it around. Like in my own county, we only have 50 cases. So it's important to really bring that cognition online, go, okay, what's actually happening here? Okay, any questions? Or anything we, anybody wants to share? We do have a question for you. Okay. How do we know when we have moved from curiosity into obsessiveness? And how do we balance finding out more in the name of curiosity and diving into the black hole of obsession that will feed our anxiety about the virus? I love that question because I know that one from the inside. So, you know, there's a spectrum. If you find yourself sitting in front of your computer for 10 hours researching COVID and you haven't eaten and haven't had anything to drink, you've probably gone from curiosity to obsession. So, so the way I would think about it is, is when you're researching something as a result of a threat, it's important to tune in, okay, how am I enjoying this research? What am I experiencing as I do this research? Do I find myself getting more stressed out as I'm reading? Um, and sometimes, right, we still need to do the research. Um, you know, particularly if you're trying to decide what's best for your family, it's important to be informed. So, so, um, so having a tolerance for the stress level is one thing, but, but when you find yourself, you know, checking the internet five times a day, then chances are, um, you've moved from curiosity to uh, obsessive, some kind of obsessive behavior, potentially driven by fear. You know, if you find yourself having difficulty kind of um, making sense of the information you're gathering, like, like, you know, thinking about it analytically, if your um, ability to 
critically think about what you're reading has gone offline. That's, that's a sign that, that, you know, you've moved from kind of cognition dominance to maybe more amygdala dominant. Um, Cause it, it's all on a spectrum. It's not black and white. We don't go from, Oh, okay. My cognition is working to, you know, um, I can, there's no cognition at all, right? It's not black and white. There's a, a range. And so this is why, from my perspective, one of the most important things for us in managing our own stress level is to really start to track what's going on inside ourselves besides our thoughts, right? Besides our thoughts. So for example, as I sit here right now, I'm aware of a little bit of belly, of butterflies in my belly because I'm sitting here, you know, giving you this presentation to a community that's dear to me. So, you know, when I think about COVID just kind of off the cuff, I noticed frustration that it's even happening. So really starting to tune into our internal world um, makes all the difference in the world and being able to assess, okay, am, am I still in curiosity or have I moved, you know, into another place that maybe isn't so good for me? Do you have any advice for living with family members who are especially anxious because of their personality traits and medical conditions? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the most important things when we're, we're sitting with family is to be able to differentiate their experience from our experience. So for example, um, as people age, their resilience for most people um, declines. I mean, they don't have the same mental faculties. Um, they might have physical difficulty that makes it difficult for them to be even aware of what's going on. So there's going to be a lot more fear and anxiety for those folks. And so, so being able to differentiate my experience from the other person's experience, not in a way that's detached, I can still care about the person, but I don't have to make their anxiety mine. I can still do things for this person. I can still be loving and supportive, but I don't have to take on their state, right? I don't have to kind of co-regulate and, and become as anxious as they are. And another piece of that is that's why self-care is so important. And I know um, one of the questions Vanessa sent me in advance of this conversation is, you know, what about first responders, right? Like everybody on the front lines of this is, is dealing with people who are truly deeply impacted by this event in very severe ways. And so as much as possible, um, um, taking care of yourself, you know, as much as you can, finding little ways to do that. But I would also say, make sure you've got people you can talk to about this. So one of the things that happens in our brains is, is that social engagement is really, really important. When we're having conversations with people, it signals, um, oh, okay, I'm okay, because I can have this conversation, and then our stress level goes down. So so, you know, find somebody to talk to about the challenging family member, not from the place of, oh my God, that person's horrible, but from the place of, you know, it's really hard for me when, you know, Fred tells me I'm not doing enough or when, like, I, I have a colleague whose husband tells her every single day that they're both going to die from COVID. And that's a lot to hold. So finding people to talk to about it, not necessarily professionals, that's a different decision, but to really have you know, buddies that you can talk to on Zoom or on the phone or socially distance is super important to keeping ourselves regulated. Thanks, Susie. Um, so the attendee responded with, my normal outlet is to go out with friends. It's harder to, to do that online, but it is important. Yes, and, and like some of my college buddies and I, we haven't made this happen yet, but like we've been talking about doing Zoom game nights and so, you know, this is where it's really important to get creative. It's like, okay, we can't go out with friends. And like, when I think about the Harvey Mudd College students, I can't even imagine how I would, how I would manage that workload without all the social engagement we used to do, you know, all the, the, the parties on, on the weekends and just, you know, the ability to come together and, and be with each other um, in a challenging environment. And so, you know, we have to get creative around around how we can make this fun. I have lots of friends that are doing Zoom cocktail parties and dinner parties and, you know, coming together, doing crafts together online and, and no, it's not the same and our brain knows it's not the same. Um, I, for one, have found that, that 
I get some social contact aside from the couple of friends that I still do see because I live by myself. But like I, I find my brain relaxes when I literally just go to the park and walk past someone. Like there's something about just literally even having a little bit of connection that can help all this settle for those of us that, that live by ourselves. And that's all the questions we have for now. Cool, thank you everyone. So I touched on this, but I really want to spend a bit of time here on, on you know, how we manage our emotions. For most of us, um, emotions are something that we think we ought to just stuff aside, put away. Oh, I'm not supposed to have them. What's wrong with me that I'm sad and upset? Um, I've heard people say, oh, you know, I'm not spiritually evolved because I feel angry. And, and I want to really normalize our feelings right now. We have a lot to be sad and angry and scared about because there's a lot of unknown and our, our lives have been fundamentally turned upside down. A lot of us are having economic difficulty, um, you know, students not getting to have their graduation. My goodness, I can't even imagine what that would be like. It was such a special event for me. Um, so, I, want, I really want to invite you to consider just in this moment right now, how do you manage your emotions? Do you stuff them? Do you criticize yourself for having them? Do you turn them on other people by lashing out? You know, that's road rage. Like, you know, we're not really ever all that angry at someone we don't know who cuts us off. Like it's usually bigger than, than the event calls for. So usually that means it's being fed by something else. Um, one of my favorite responses when my emotions come up is I start, um, I, I, I immediately have the impulse that I need to do something. It's like, right now is the most important time ever to take the trash out. Like, literally, I will decide there is some chore in the house I have to do. And, and when I notice that inside myself, it's like, okay, what am I disconnecting from? So I want to, I want to, give a little bit of a different take on emotions than maybe you've heard before. So, so Dr. Lawrence Heller, who is my primary teacher in the work that I do with people, he created something called the neuroaffective relational model. He talks about emotions that every emotion is a communication to the environment. So rather than just an, this annoying experience that we have inside us, that each emotion is actually trying to tell us something. So, with anger, it's, I don't like this, I don't want this. It's, it's a healthy protest. With sadness, it's, oh my God, I've lost something that's dear to me. Right now that might be, geez, I can't go visit my sister. Or, you know, I can't go to the gym and, and, and hang out with my Pilates buddies. Um, and so it's really, really important for us to actually tune in to those emotions because they help us know what's true for us. So when we tune in and we let ourselves feel angry or sad, um, and those emotions th flow through us, they will subside when we actually get in contact with what they're trying to, trying to tell us. And then we can make a better decision about, oh, well, you know, I thought I wanted this, but now that I've noticed that, you know, I've moved through this anger, I actually really want this other thing over here, right? And, and a lot of times it can separate the, the motivation from a survival strategy. So, you know, I might think I wanna do something to please somebody else, but when I drop in and go, you know, actually I really don't like that. I wanna do this other thing. Like it helps us be more authentic and more true to ourselves. And that's really important right now. Um, and I think that's actually something really important when we're with challenging family members not with the person, but, but carving out some space to go, God, I really hate it. You know, when this person criticizes me or yells at me or whatever to really own, I don't like that. And then when you own that, you can decide if there's a behavior. Like one of the things that happens for us with anger is for most of us, particularly in our childhood, we link behavior and emotion. And those two are not the same thing. We have an emotion and a lot of times when we're reactive, we do something and we don't even realize those are separate things. When we feel our emotions, we can then decide what to do. And so for a lot of us, anger got tied in very tightly with violence 
whether it was emotional or physical violence. And those two things are not at all necessarily linked um, uh, unless people are reactive and unconscious. So, you know, we can feel angry towards somebody and we can really own, oh, I don't like that. I deserve respect, for example. And then we can decide, you know, is it even appropriate to say something? So, for example, when my, my 96-year-old father with dementia, you know, yell, yells and screams at me because he doesn't like what's happening to him, it's not appropriate for me to confront him about that because it's not going to make any difference. But by just having the ability to move through the emotion, I can actually just be with his anger and not take it on, which is super important right now. It helps us be actually a resource for the people in our lives that matter to us. And even, you know, in our work life with our, our colleagues and if we have them, employees, or, or even with our, our superiors when they're freaking out about what's going on. Let's see. And I just want to say, one of the ways that we make emotions worse is by avoiding them. So, you know, we think it's good to stuff them down. And a lot of times we learn that because as kids, we got punished for having anger or we got sent to our room. That was the main, main one for many of us is that we learned that, okay, if I feel, if I feel an emotion, I'm going to be isolated, right? I'm going to be disconnected from my family. And that must mean that, that I and or the emotion is somehow bad. Like, that's the message that, that so many of us got. And so of course we would learn to, to stuff them because we didn't, didn't want to be isolated. Children actually hate being isolated for the most part. So, so it's important to start to tease these things apart and go, okay, well, what's actually true inside me? Oh, wait a minute, right? So, so when, we, um, when we avoid our emotions, we make them worse and they leak out, right? So for example, the family member who's not dealing with Corona very well, chances are inside that person, um, there's unprocessed emotion for th from things that are completely unrelated. You know, if, if, if I snap at the mailman, it has nothing to do with the mailman. You know, one of my, one of my teachers is, is fond of saying that, you know, when, when, when his partner snaps at him about the dishes, it's not about the dishes, it's about something else. Right, and so it's important to start to tease that apart. Any questions? We have no questions right now. Okay. And I also want to say, you know, a lot of us were also taught to discharge um, emotion. So, you know, there's a whole particularly in the 70s and 80s, there was a whole focus on catharsis and pounding pillows and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it can feel really good, for example, to go be physical. And, and um, you know, I think those techniques can be important if, if what's immediately necessary is to discharge the en energy. But in terms of actually resolving and bringing those emotions to completion, it doesn't solve them because it's not actually attuning to and paying attention to and tuning into, okay, what's the intention of this emotion? Okay, I'm angry because I actually feel isolated. Okay, I need more connection. Okay, what can I do about that? Right, rather than just letting that leak out all over the place and inadvertently pushing, pushing people away. So I wanna, um, name some keys from my, my perspective to stress relief. The first one I want to talk about here is to really manage your perception. If you remember from my definition at the beginning of our conversation, um, we feel stress when we perceive um, threat, when we perceive um, feeling overwhelmed and like we don't have enough resources. So when you feel stress, take a moment and tune in, okay, what's happening here? okay, I'm afraid of this virus. Okay, well, what's, what's my actual susceptibility to this? Okay, well, I do have an underlying condition. Okay, well, what can I do about that, right? How can I support my well-being? So really getting, getting clear about the perception. So even getting clear about, um, you know, okay, the COVID threat is real. Okay, but does that mean there's a tiger in my living room right now? No, actually, it doesn't. Okay, is 
there any real threat? Like you can literally orient and look around and ask yourself, is there immediate threat? And often by differentiating um, the distance of the real threat, you know, it's something out there that could happen rather than, okay, I'm actually, you know, being chased right now. That will help us settle. Um, it's really important to take time to tune in, even if your life has become absurdly, absurdly full because you've got, you know, kids at home, because um, you're homeschooling, because you're working from home, because your whole schedule has been thrown up in the air. Even if you carve five or 10 minutes um, a day out to just notice um, what you're experiencing and see if you can go deeper than the thoughts. So, you know, for most of us, it's pretty easy to, to tune into, okay, my brain is chattering and here's all the things that are moving through it. But often what's driving all that thinking is underneath it, there's feelings, sensations, and needs we haven't attuned to. You know, one of the um, survival strategies that's so common for people, particularly people in the helping professions, is I don't have needs, your needs are primary, and, and there can be a real, um, at least on the surface, we can feel really good about taking care of other people ra rather than ourselves. The problem with that is that eventually we burn out. We, that is just simply unsustainable because everybody has needs. And again, I want to name that, that our relationship to our needs is born out of how our needs were treated in childhood. So for example, if, if we had parents who didn't attune to our basic needs like food, clothing, and shelter, or didn't attune to who we really are, well, I want you to be a doctor, I want you to be an engineer, we learn to disconnect from our actual true heart's desire. Or as my teacher Larry Heller says, we learn to need only what the environment will give us. And that's super important. So when we start to tune into ourselves, we step aside from those old patterns. We go, okay, what do I actually need right now? Another piece is, is connection is super important. It's my, my belief that even those of us that are, are introverts need connection. We, we as humans are, are wired to be social. Um, for many of us, our social, social connections have been eliminated many, many of them. So we have to find creative ways to connect with people. And, you know, thankfully the online world um, makes a lot of that possible. But seeing if you can really make that a priority, particularly if you're working on the front lines, connecting with others and sharing what's going on. Um, use tools to settle your nervous system. You know, I'm a, in, in the work that I do with people, I help people get to the root of what's going on that they feel stressed, which is really important for long-term well-being. But in times like this, uh, it can be really, really helpful to do stuff like this vagus nerve holding that I did. You know, if you saw a snapshot of me in the grocery store, I, I, I will often stand in line and just have my hands on my belly. Like this is the kind of stuff you can smuggle in. You can do it while you're in a meeting. You know, um, you can do it while you're having a conversation with a difficult family member. You can do it while you're feeling um, strung out yourself. Um, and this is really a time for profound creativity. Um, you know, we as mutters are very, very good at, at, at coming up with um, novel ideas for things. You know, what if the silver lining of, of this whole experience is coming up with uh, new ways of connecting, new things that we like to do that we hadn't even thought of before. And that's actually really exciting. Um, take the time to get curious about your survival strategies. It's like, well, why is it that I always put other people first? Or what's going on that I, I feel this impulse to please other people or that I need to be in control? You are not your survival strategies. Who you've come to believe yourself to be may not even be true. And and ask yourself if, if it's these strategies that are, exact, are actually contributing um, to how stressed you feel. How much of the stress that you're feeling right now is actually coming from the demands that you place on yourself rather than anything that's coming from the environment. So when we unravel these internal beliefs and strategies, we actually reduce our internal stress feedback loops. And that makes us more resilient when things happen. Um, the next one's a big one for um, 
for anybody who's on the front lines of this, reduce your secondary trauma. Now, I know if you're actually working with COVID patients or you're in you know, EMT or, or you have family members who are, it, that's a really hard, hard thing to do because you're with people who, who are experiencing trauma all the time. But this is where, you know, limit your exposure to the news. If you have a tendency to, to think that violence is entertaining, see if you can back, back that off. Like if you have this tendency to keep yourself um, really, really wired, stuck on, see if you can incorporate into your life more um, experiences of, of actually settling down, of actually, you know, kind of unwinding rather than keeping yourself revved. Um, and if all of this feels like too much, if you're, if you go, oh my God, I'm not sleeping, I'm, I'm ha constantly ruminating about this thing, I don't know how to deal with, you know, this, this partner of mine who, who keeps telling me we're all going to die. It's a great time to get help. There are more resources than ever out there right now because so many people have moved online. So it's no longer, you know, where we live is no longer a barrier to getting the absolute best help possible. And, you know, I can be a resource for you for that. You know, I'm in, my, my email address is, is um, and phone number are, are part of the slide deck. And if, if you feel like you want help, I can um, um, hook you up with people that that um, can be resources for you. Because this is a really, really, really challenging time. Um, you know, asking yourself, oh, I, or saying to yourself, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. It's like, no, actually it's very human to be feeling this way. And, and, and I really want to stress that. So I just want to see, um, we have about 10 minutes left here, and I just want to see if there's any more questions. All right, Susie. So I am in the field of youth development. I am starting to plan a few well, webinars for 12th graders with a focus on resilience and coping with the loss of expected rites of passage. What are two to three points you would suggest I highlight with them? Yeah, it's really tough when the when the rites of passage are are um, are um, sidetracked. The first thing that comes to mind is is to really um, set up ways for them to express their feelings about it because because it is a loss. It's something to grieve um, that they don't get to to move through graduation in the way that they normally would or the way that their you know peers have. Um, you know, connect with what's bringing them joy right now. So maybe they are still able to connect with their friends. Maybe they. They, they um, can connect with what, what they're looking forward to in this next phase of life, even though it's going to be different. So, you know, I know, for example, a lot of, a lot of seniors, you know, they're, they're headed off to college, but who knows what college is even going to look like because there's so much uncertainties. What they're excited about, and to the extent this feels okay with them, having them locate that excitement on the inside. So... So for example, when I, when I have an opportunity to give a talk like this, like my heart starts to open because I love sharing this material so much. And so, in, you know, inviting, inviting them to, um, to really feel what's going on is super important. Um, yeah, and creating their own ritual. You know, I know a lot of schools are doing online things, but, but, you know, seeing if, if they have friends that they want to create their own ritual for, for um, transitioning that maybe they haven't thought about before. So what if you have someone in your life who is clearly feeling the stress, overwhelm, anxiety, but won't talk to you no matter what you're doing, um, maybe because he's embarrassed by it or because he doesn't want to burden you with his stress, um, it seems to be particularly common among men. Um, what can I do to help? Totally. Yeah. Um, so if affection is part of your relationship, one thing you can do is literally just ask them, hey, can I sit next to you? Right. One of the things that we underestimate um, in our culture, like there's this constant em emphasis on what can I do? And as part of that, what what happens is we don't realize how much our own presence is actually a source of support. So just literally sitting with somebody, 
if they're open to it, putting a hand on their arm or putting a hand on their leg, like literally just physical contact can send a message to their nervous system. Oh, okay, it's okay right now. I have connection. I'm not isolated. I'm not all alone. You know, because a lot of people don't want to talk about this and that's real. Um, so helping them find other ways to settle through connection, through contact. Another one that, um, that I've used at times with, with clients is I'll literally just sit with them and put my foot next to theirs, right? And, and, you know, all of these things are things, by the way, that you can do with children as well. And a lot of times kids are more amenable to that. Um, you know, you can do the vagus nerve thing. If you have a family that's open to that kind of stuff, which many are not, so I want to acknowledge that, but, you know, just sitting with your hands on your heart and just notice what happens. Um, because yeah, we do have a tendency to shame ourselves um, for our reactions to this. And, and that's, a, that's a deep process. Um, in the work that I do, I look at shame as a, a process and not a thing. It's something we do when we're having a reaction to, you know, what's going on. That is all the questions we have for now. Uh, we have about four minutes. Um, Cindy, do you still have uh, another slide for everyone? I want to, yeah, I have a resources slide here. So a few of these are things that I've created. Um, I created an infographic about the healing process. And the reason why I want to mention that in particular right now is that I want to name that all of this stuff goes in waves, right? We can feel stressed and we can settle. It's like, wait a minute, I thought I got over that. It's like it, a lot of times the emotions and the stress will come in waves and that's totally normal. So the, the infographic that I created talks about how, you know, we might feel better and expand a little bit and then maybe something happens or who knows what, and then we contract. And so it's almost like breathing, right? When we, when we inhale, we expand, there's always an exhale with an inhale. So that's a normal process. Uh, also for the first responders out there or, um, from people who have family members who are first responders or are working on the front lines in some way. The book Trauma Stewardship is phenomenal for helping people navigate the whole, whole um, risk of secondary trauma. There's a lot of exercises in there, ways of thinking about things. Um, and if you're interested in the whole stress body connection, I love the book When the Body Says No. I also love the book When the, Bo uh, the Body Keeps the Score. Both of those books are great for um, helping us understand on a very technical level um, the mind-body connection. We cannot separate um, our thoughts from our feelings from our body. Like we are one being and that's really important. A lot in our culture, there's this tendency to want to stay split off and it's just not true. And then finally, if you're interested in um, complex PTSD and, and an approach to really um, resolving the root of, of the difficulties that um, come about during childhood, then the book Healing Developmental Trauma written by Lawrence Heller, my teacher, is a phenomenal resource. Um, he wrote it for clinicians, but it's actually very, very, very understandable. Um, a lot of my clients have read it and really found it helpful. So that's, that's it for me. Um, I just want to thank Harvey Mudd for having me. It's such a huge honor. I want to um, acknowledge again Larry Heller for um, the brilliance of, of uh, his work. It's really made it possible for us to heal from these difficult patterns. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in learning more, um, please stay in touch. I'm here. I'm really um, available to be a resource. So thank you. Thank you, Susie, for your time and insights on stress and self-care during this challenging time. We really appreciate you uh, giving this talk for us. I hope everyone enjoyed our talk today. Thank you so much for attending this event. Uh, we will definitely distribute the recording and presentation material in the following days, so don't worry, you will get it. Uh, next up in, our, in the next uh, MUD Talk series is co-founders of Voodoo Manufacturing, Jonathan Schwartz, class of 13, and Max Freifeld, class of 13, talking about how their company is using 3D printing to help in the fight during the COVID-19 global pandemic on next Thursday, May 14th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. This event is open to the entire HMC community, so I would uh, recommend registering again if you'd like to. 
Finally, I do want to offer a word of thanks to all those joining in today who have supported HMC's Community Emergency Aid Fund. To date, we've raised just over $254,000 in gifts and pledges that will help us provide assistance to members of our community during these uncertain times. You can find all the information we've, I've talked about uh, and much more on our online offering page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hmc.edu and clicking on online offerings. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you all here with us. Uh, have a great day, a wonderful weekend, and please stay safe and take care.